Ben Pierce on the Rosa Tracker here, and today NASA launched the Mars Perseverance rover along with the Ingenuity Chopper, which I'm personally very, very excited about, on their way to Mars. And despite a slightly rocky start, they went into safe mode immediately because it went through the shadow of the Earth. They're doing quite well and they're talking with the spacecraft and everything's going fantastic. Now, except for the fact that I know this and I'm going to show a picture of the actual launch of the spacecraft, you might be able to say based on this next fact that I could tell this any time. And that is that it is going to land on Mars on February 18th. Now, how is it that I know this regardless of the launch date? The launch date had a 21 day roughly period of time, but no matter what day they launched, it was going to land on Mars on the exact same day, February 18th, 2021. And people wanted to know why this was. I wanted to know why this was. And it took me a while to get a satisfactory answer. The first thing I did is I reached out to Tori Bruno, who is the CEO of ULA and answers a lot of questions. And he said that this was done intentionally. This is not some kind of a byproduct, but it was done intentionally. Although I couldn't get a reason out of him for that. But I couldn't fear the life of me understand why this was. But finally, JPL released a paper that shows why they chose this exact landing date. And it's very fascinating and I wanted to talk to you guys about this. First of all, it's an interplay of three different factors and a number of smaller factors that, that we'll get to in a bit. But the primary factors are the balance of the energy required at launch, the speed that it's going to arrive on Mars, and the communication when it arrives on Mars. So let's talk about those in this order. The speed required to get there is known as the C3 energy. This is the energy beyond the escape velocity. It's used as an energy versus a speed because it really depends on where you are. If you apply the same speed when you're in high Earth orbit, you're not going to get the same effect as you will if you apply it in low Earth orbit. But the energy is what really matters. You can roughly think of this as the square root of the delta V if you applied the delta V at the smartest spot. So the way that these are predicted, and the truth is, is you can launch to Mars at any time and arrive on any date. The question is, is how much energy are you willing to spend? Well, there's these charts that are called Lambertian charts or more commonly pork chop plots, which they kind of look like pork chops, hence their name. And they will have on one axis the day that you launch from Earth and on the other axis the day that you arrive at Mars. And they show you how much energy is required to make that particular transfer. They're called pork chop plots because they tend to kind of have a line in the middle like pork chops do. And that's just kind of stuck since whoever pointed that out probably 50 years ago. So with these plots, you can say exactly the energy. Now, you'll notice that they have a range that they're kind of exactly the same value for some period of time. The energy requirements don't differ hugely when you're near the optimum. So plus or minus a few days doesn't matter. It's pretty easy to have a 20 day launch window. And in fact, there was 20 days of launch window 21, I think, plus an extra 10 days that they could take if they did a little bit more analysis to show that the rocket could do it. And they would have been just fine. The second one, and actually more important, but less recognized, is how fast will you be going when you arrive at Mars? Now, if we take the very, very simplistic case and say that you're heading straight to Mars and you want to be accelerating it super, super fast, and then you want to be able to land on there. Well, when you get at Mars, you're going to be going super, super fast. You got to slow that down. So, you have to figure out how much are you going to have to slow the spacecraft down. And it turns out this is the bigger constraint. It's pretty easy to get a little bit bigger of a rocket. It doesn't cost very much, but to bring more fuel or more heat shield or something like that, that is really, really expensive. And so that's the larger concern is how fast will you be going once you actually arrive at Mars? These also have a very similar shape, although they tend to skew towards somewhat of the longer 
trajectories, I believe. It varies a little bit. But this is the major constraint where the launch window was chosen based off of how fast you're going to be going when you actually get to the planet Mars. Okay, so what about the other factors? If this is all that you take into account, then you're still going to have kind of a line type of shape so that depending on your exact trajectory, you're going to kind of show up at a different day depending on your launch day. But they actually chose very specifically to always be on the same day. Why is that? Well, when you're landing a spacecraft on Mars, other than landing there safely, the most important thing is that if there is a failure, you need to be able to identify what the failure was so you can keep it from ever happening again. And in order to do that, you have to have some kind of a spacecraft or a direct connection to Earth during the landing process. Now, it turns out the slower trajectories work better for the direct to Earth path, but there's some interesting options. We have a number of spacecraft that are able to pick up the signals and relay them. So there's three NASA spacecraft that are currently in orbit. There's the Mars Odyssey, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the MAVEN probe. So Mars Odyssey is not going to be in position to observe the launch. It just, they could have done it, but it would have to change its orbit pretty dramatically to make it work. And they'd rather keep it where it's at right now. It doesn't have a lot of fuel left. It's a pretty old spacecraft. So they're not going to do that. But MRO was able to do this, and MAVEN was also able to adjust their orbits so that they could be over a particular point in time where they could receive the signal. If you think about it, the planet's huge. The odds that you're going to have one satellite overhead at a very specific point in time is pretty small unless you deliberately plan it. Now, because these spacecraft have limited fuel, they have to make adjustments a long time in advance. MAVEN actually made an orbital adjustment about two years ago in order to support the landing of the Perseverance rover that's still going to happen in another six months. They probably could do something a little bit quicker, but they want to minimize the fuel usage and minimize the disruption to the science. And that's the best way they can make it happen by having it happen over a lengthy period of time. These spacecraft, they tend to want to have them go over the pole at a particular point in time. So that way they have constant shadows and makes the science easier. It's called a sun synchronous orbit. You can do those on Earth, you can do those on Mars too. And most of the spacecraft that are scientific are doing this, at least the more modern ones uh, from NASA in particular. Some of the other countries, they do some different things because if you're sending one spacecraft, you might not want to optimize it for the science specifically of Mars. You might want to study the moons and you have to have a different kind of orbit for that. Okay, all that being said, it turns out that the limiting factor is the availability of spacecraft to observe this landing, to be able to relay any kind of unusual thing that may happen to, to it back to Earth. Now, neither MAVEN nor MRO has what's called bent pipe. This means that they can send the signals in real time back to Earth. But they're both going to record the data so that way they can send it back to Earth within a couple of hours and get it there so that the engineers can figure out what went wrong if something does actually go wrong. Odds are pretty good it's not going to go wrong because NASA's really figured out how to get to Mars. But Mars has kind of a bad reputation. I'm going to talk about that in a future video in the next week or so on this channel. So subscribe if you want to find out and ring the bells. Okay, anyways, back to this. There are a couple of other things that are a factor. You kind of want to minimize going through the shadows of Earth in particular. The crew stage, which is currently in charge of the spacecraft until it basically gets to Mars, will detach when it gets to Mars, but it's in charge of things now. It doesn't have to deal with Eclipse normally, so you may want to avoid that. They determined to not actually do that with this, and that's actually what caused the problem I mentioned in the beginning of this video. The extreme cold going through the Earth's eclipse caused this to happen. It turns out, though, that they're not going to go through Earth's eclipse once they're far, far away. It just kind of works out that way. 
So spacecraft's in safe mode, it's completely fine and it'll be recovered shortly. The other thing that you want to minimize is the usage of fuel during the cruise stage. You really want to make sure that you don't go over your fuel budget. So they have a very small budget and there's a couple of things that will happen to adjust this. If you're going faster, you're going to have to use a little bit more fuel. So you have to take that into account. The most important factors are the three that I mentioned at the beginning. In order, they are the velocity that you arrive at Mars because it's hard to build a larger heat shield to absorb all of that energy. The ability to receive the signals from the spacecraft when it's landing because you want to understand any problems that may arise during the landing phase. You've only got one shot at this after all. And then the amount of energy from the rocket. The reason why the rocket's the less concerning one is because it's easier to build a better rocket than it is to put more fuel onto the spacecraft. I think they could have easily added another solid booster, for instance, to the spacecraft to, or the rocket to make it go quicker. But increasing the amount of fuel on the spacecraft or really the heat shield, that would have taken some considerable amount of work. Anyways, that's how you get to Mars. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have. Thank you to my Patreons and Discord members who helped me to put these videos together. You can find out more information in the links below. I've also included a link to the paper that I learned all of this kind of stuff from. You can read more about it if you're scientifically inclined. Thank you guys so much for everything. And thank you just for sticking through to the end. I really appreciate you guys. Until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.